Croeso a genilliad cenedlaethol Cymru ac i'r peerhead heddiw, diolch yn fawr am ddod. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the peerhead today for an event which I hope will begin the task of identifying solutions to one of the biggest challenges facing Welsh democracy in, uh, or facing democracy in Wales. Um, my name is uh, David Melding and I'm the Deputy Presiding Officer of the National Assembly. Uh, this conference was to be uh, um, hosted and opened by the presiding officer, Rosemary Butler. And I, I'm sorry to have to tell you that a, a serious family issue uh, prevents her being here today, but I know that we will all uh, want to send our best wishes to Rose uh, 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 today. The title of this ev event is Addressing the Welsh Democratic Deficit. Many of you could be forgiven for thinking that devolution was introduced in order to arrest any actual perceived deficit, deficit uh, of this kind uh, in Wales. Indeed, it was at the very heart of the devolution campaign in 1997, uh, how to make the democratic process in Wales uh, uh, more effective and transparent. We now have an institution that is elected directly by the people of Wales to make Welsh laws with a core aim to reflect the hopes and aspirations of the people of Wales. But how can my colleagues and I demonstrate that we are reflecting those hopes and aspirations in our discussions and actions if large sections of the population have limited exposure to our work and how it impacts their lives? That is what the presiding officer called the democratic deficit in her speech uh, to the Royal Television Society uh, 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 last year, which was held in this uh, very building. We have a UK m media, both broadcasters and print, which often fails to relay the huge differences in approach to public policy in devolved fields, such as health and education, to the substantial uh, Welsh audiences, and indeed uh, 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 how it reflects in England and other parts of the United King Kingdom uh, as well. Research by Professor Anthony King and Cardiff University's School of Journalism highlighted the fact that uh, some of our leading UK broadcasters and other news outlets often default to a sort of Anglo-centric position, a position which uh, promotes policy issues affecting only England as though they apply to the whole of the UK. Professor King's original report was published in 2008 and at the uh, RTS annual lecture last year, he noted that despite efforts by broadcasters, uh, many aspects of the problem persists. There are grounds for uh, hope and uh, there has been progress and I think it's important that's uh, reflected uh, this morning and only uh, on Tuesday evening I was at uh, Cardiff University when they uh, gave out their innovation awards to the various uh, uh, departments of the university that have worked with uh, uh, outside organisations to promote uh, key ideas and the School of Journalism has been working with the BBC uh, to uh, analyse output uh, across the network, not just in Wales, but right across the BBC network, and has identified ways of conveying stories so that uh, the differences that devolution brings and the reflections you can make on England, uh, as, as well as the obvious uh, uh, differences in approach between policies as they apply in the different home nations of the United Kingdom, has started to affect how stories are presented, chosen, uh, and relayed, but there's still a lot of work uh, uh, to do. The problem is often compounded by financial pressures faced by our indigenous uh, Welsh national and regional press, which leaves many unable to really uh, provide comprehensive coverage of assembly news. And anyone who's been in the assembly as long as I have, I was uh, one of the original members in 99, we just see those differences very physically in the declining numbers in the press corps here at uh, the uh, assembly, and that obviously has had a big impact in, the, uh, in print journalism in particular. And when you look to Scotland with its own editions of UK newspapers and its own edition of uh, Newsnight, uh, I, I don't think it's surprising, especially to our, you know, visitors who are coming in uh, uh, this morning from outside Wales, uh, to realise that we in Wales feel that uh, we've not really uh, had uh, a fair deal in the way uh, the media relates Welsh politics. The PO made a commitment at the RTS lecture towards a series of uh, sessions to explore 
solutions, and that's important, solutions to the issues that she outlined. And today's event is uh, part of that uh, commitment. And so the PO has asked us to explore a number of uh, themes, such as, such as why broadcasters approach devolution in the way they do, and how we can influence them uh, to change some of, this, uh, uh, some of the coverage uh, and, and produce more effective uh, uh, analysis and, and reportage. How to get the UK press to reflect policy differences between the nations. This is you know, the great value of devolution that it uh, provides for different uh, approaches and uh, a level of experimentation and the public to be properly informed as our electorate uh, need to be aware of at least some of the major differences that are going on. What are the main obstacles to raising the profile of Welsh democracy in our regional press? And again, I think uh, we need to hear the, the, the clear views of those involved in producing uh, uh, regional output. Uh, I, I know we're not going to go back to the 19th century days of you know, three or four full pages of every councillor's uh, remarks on uh, uh, a rather uh, 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 detailed aspects of uh, planning policy or whatever, but uh, that we surely should have an aspiration to have uh, uh, more regional coverage than we currently get. And it may be partly the, the way political parties here and the assembly is structured that needs to, to help that process. It's going to be a two-way thing, I'm sure. And uh, very importantly, the uh, role of new media platforms uh, and how they are likely to uh, influence news and information gathering in the future. And they've already partly transformed it. I was talking earlier about uh, how backbenchers have many more opportunities, I think, to engage in, uh, in public debate. Uh, and uh, we're seeing that uh, not just at Westminster, but also what uh, happens here in Wales. Uh, and indeed, the, the last, this last point will be a subject uh, of its very own session in this building on the 12th of June, so uh, space is still available, I think, when Welsh bloggers and those running hyper-local websites, that's a new one on me, but uh, I know it's important, uh, they will take part in a discussion about their role in this important ongoing debate. Uh, can I just briefly inform you of the, uh, some of the work the Assembly has been doing to date? Uh, various uh, committees have held inquiries into these sorts of issues, ranging from devolution of broadcasting to exploring suitable business models for the Welsh newspaper industry. In response to the reports from uh, the oh, sorry, in response to the, the report from the Communities Equality and Local Government Committee in May last year, the First Minister asked the chair uh, of was asked, sorry, to chair the Creative Industry Sectors Panel and then form a task and finish group, the Broadcasting Advisory Panel, to review matters in relation to uh, broadcasting. But the Welsh Government's reach only goes so far, so the PO was very keen uh, to get uh, uh, the direct involvement of renowned media figures, and I don't think that's talking them up. We have a fantastic panel, and uh, both this morning and then this afternoon in terms of regional output, and we're so grateful uh, to uh, all those who have agreed to speak to us this morning uh, and so that uh, uh, with a bit of luck we really will ignite an exciting debate. So that's an invitation to all of you in the audience to be uh, sparky and uh, we just don't want to hear the, uh, the usual received uh, information and opinions. We want uh, uh, ideas that will move us forward and sometimes perhaps uh, will unsettle us and challenge us. Uh, and I must commend, and indeed, I want to finish on a relatively, uh, well, on a very positive note, uh, that much coverage is good, and I think it's important that uh, uh, we all uh, uh, are, are aware of that. And uh, this morning on Good Morning Wales, there was an excellent piece uh, on, uh, uh, on this conference with Ke Kevin Maguire, who we will hear uh, this morning, and the youth mayor, I think she was, of uh, uh, Bridge End, and it, it was just an excellent engaging item and I think it does show what happens when you really get it right. And I, I would also say uh, uh, there's a big issue in terms of uh, health reorganization going on in Wales at the moment and that was discussed with a, a very hard hitting item and a, an excellent interview and a tough interview uh, of uh, a, a local assembly member, not uh, in my party, but again I thought that was uh, 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 media coverage at its very best and reflected on a debate indeed that we, or uh, an, uh, an urgent question that we had in the Assembly yesterday. So can I thank uh, uh, all of the today's uh, panellists and you, the audience, for agreeing to take part and I'm sure you will find it uh, uh, thoroughly uh, worthwhile. But particular thanks to Professor Richard uh, Sandbrook, former head of BBC Network News 
and now very importantly, uh, head of the Cardiff School of Journalism, who has kindly agreed to steer us through today's uh, discussions. And I now invite you, Richard, and the, uh, the rest of the, this morning's panelists uh, to take the stage. And uh, we uh, look forward to uh, this morning's discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And uh, good morning, everyone. Very good to see so many of you here for, uh, for an important discussion through today. Um, as David said, I, uh, uh, I'm Professor of Journalism. I run the Centre for Journalism uh, at uh, Cardiff University, but used to work for the BBC. So I promise you I'm impartial to my bone uh, in, this, in this debate as in everything else. Um, we have a great panel here this morning to, uh, to discuss these issues. Uh, on my left, your right, is uh, Peter Riddle, who is director of the Institute for Government, and of course, um, before that was uh, uh, a political commentator and assistant editor for The Times. We have uh, Kevin Maguire, who's an assistant editor on The Daily Mirror, and who was on uh, Good Morning Wales this morning, um, discussing these issues. And at the end, my former colleague, uh, Peter Knowles, who is controller of BBC Parliament and Democracy Live, uh, for the BBC. Now, um, the way it's going to work is I'll invite each of the panelists to, uh, to present their, their views on the, on the issue, and then we will take questions at each stage uh, along the way and, and round off with a, a broader discussion and broader questions at the end. In the unlikely event that you're all very shy in coming forward with questions, I think I know just about enough of you to pick on people, but I'm assuming that's not going to be necessary. If you'd like to tweet about it, please do. The hashtag is news deficit. Uh, it's up there uh, on, the, uh, on the screens for you. Uh, we have a very simple task. We simply have to come up with solutions to the democratic deficit today. Um, but of course, before we can come up with solutions, we've got to define the problem. So that may take us a little longer. We'll see how we go. But uh, let's get underway. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, run through to uh, between 12.30 and 1 when we'll break for lunch, and then we'll have the second panel this afternoon. But Peter, perhaps I could invite you to, uh, to start us off. Shall I go? Yeah. Please do. <coughs> I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And indeed, I'm, I feel a bit more comfortable being here um, now as director of the Institute for Government than I would have done in my journalistic days, for reasons I'll explain. Um, the Institute for Government is a non-partisan charity concerned with improving the effectiveness of government, not just at the centre, but also throughout the UK. We are London-based, but very interested in developments in Wales and the other nations um, within the UK with devolved governments. Indeed, one of our forthcoming projects is going to be the impact on UK governments and the centre of the process of devolution, not just Scotland, um, I think there's too much focus just on Scotland, but also Wales, Northern Ireland, and some of the uh, impact of elected mayors within England. But it perhaps says a lot about my current role and my past one. This is my third working visit to Cardiff in the last 12 months, which is, as m which is more, actually, more than I did during the previous 12 years I had as a political journalist. Um, I think that, and I, I certainly don't think that's atypical um, of, of my colleagues who are political journalists at all. And you could argue, and Kevin may make the point uh, uh, um, um, from, from his angle, that if you also look, and it doesn't apply to him, but it does apply to a number of my former colleagues and his current colleagues, um, the same point would apply um, to some extent to um, uh, Edinburgh, certainly to Belfast, and also to a large number of parts of the big cities of England too. Um, the London-centric charge is a very strong one. And um, in the uh, presiding officer's speech, I largely agree with the uh, analysis she did in her speech last year about the Anglo-centric nature of the national print media. Um, I'm going to put broadcasters aside because um, my good friend Peter Knowles can f fully deal with that. And anyway, there are special issues, both of the BBC Charter, I mean, the inquiry, um, which looked, um, um, was it six years ago, five, six years ago, at those issues. You mentioned Tony King and his report and so on. Um, those are special issues which I think are distinct from the print media. Now, uh, clearly there are both commercial and competitive pressures facing newspapers. And I think there's also a perverse and asymmetrical result of devolution, which affects all three of the main devolved nations. The first has led to a downgrading of political news full stop. Um, as many of the complaints by MPs as opposed to AMs or MSPs or whatever um, are rather similar. There's a, not only less political news in lots of papers, and this doesn't matter where you are in the market at all. Um, there's a shift in emphasis towards personality clash, scandal and splits over policy, procedure and process. 
But in many respects, I think the second, tr second trend is as interesting, which is a ghettoization of news. I was very struck during my period when I was chief political commentator of the Times, and um, that, and I, I'm, I'm always been rather interested in devolution and the impact and the diversity it produces, that there are actually rather interesting things happening in the three devolved nations which London can learn about. Um, but that there was, there was a real sense um, th that it's fine, Wales, um, Scotland have got devolution, Northern Ireland did a bit later, fine, let them get on with it. And we needn't bother or be interested. And that was been a very prevailing attitude amongst news executives, not just news executives, uh, as I'll mention later. Um, the view was that given that this has happened, why would readers, and by definition, most of the readers of any uh, um, London-based paper in England, by, you know, for fairly obvious reasons, um, why would they be interested in what happens in Wales and Scotland? It's fine, Wales and Scotland can look after themselves, and also Northern Ireland in its very different way. Uh, it was brought home to me, um, particularly um, in the uh, sense of when you look at, at the coverage as the reports and the presiding officer's speech made, there's very little coverage of um, the elections, uh, their regular intervals, and the, also the different political systems applying in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, there is some focus and realisation because it's a different political system. But the, the, the tend to be surprised at some of the election results, not just the assembly election results, but also what happens in the general elections. One of the least predicted phenomena was actually the Tories doing rather well in the last general election in Wales, because the very few people had travelled around and appreciated what was happening. They didn't realise there was a big impact on the UK-wide result um, of what was happening in Wales, quite a significant one, in fact, and indeed it could well be uh, in two years' time. Now, that's all produced the faults which um, the presiding officer identified in her speech last uh, December, of papers ignoring the distinctions between legislation applying to the whole of the UK or solely to England or referring to England when it means England and Wales. I mean, I know that infuriates people in, in Wales with some justice. Uh, quite interesting, if in the next developments there is a separate legal personality and separate legal jurisdiction in Wales, which is obviously a, a, a further step to be considered, what impact that has. But the sense, a lot of the debate, which has been produced, for example, on the West Lothian question, the Mackay Commission report, um, where Wales was very strongly represented um, uh, on, on the committee report, w was t tends to focus on Scottish legislation or rest of the UK legislation and blurring England and Wales and just what is England. Now, that anyway, what, regardless of whether Wales has a separate... Um, uh, uh, legal jurisdiction and legal system is going to get increasingly complicated um, because of the evolving nature of devolution anyway, which is happening in Wales following the referendum and other changes which are uh, uh, underway. I don't think there are any clear-cut um, solutions in there. And one thing I, I, I would mention is quite interesting phenomenon of what I'm talking about. When I was on the Times, we had a Scottish tradition, of course, no Welsh tradition. Um, indeed, the correspondent covering Wales was based in Bristol. Um, in, in my period on, on the paper. I, I'm not sure what the position is now. But the Times had a very, very good Scottish tradition. Um, but the editors in London didn't think it was interesting for Scottish news to appear in the UK-wide edition. In fact, we had some really good journalists in Scotland. Didn't think it was significant. Again, on the characterisation that um, Scotland, only people in Scotland would be interested. And it's even worse, obviously, in, in Wales um, because of the absence of those editions. Um, I won't go into the um, uh, problems facing the Welsh-based media. That's the this afternoon's discussion. I don't know little. I know little of it, except of course the commercial pressures which are affecting um, all mainstream media at present. Now, are there any straightforward solutions? No. You can wring your hands and complain, but essentially the papers aren't going to change their approaches. Um, however, I'm not totally pessimistic. I'm, I'm aware of the of Richard's charge to try and um, come up with solutions. But one of the points I would make is the danger of exaggerating the media aspect of it. Um, I felt over my time as a journalist, uh, my 40 years as a journalist, and I see it now from a very different angle, running a research institute and um, being in very close contact with all sorts of politicians. There's a, ten a wonderful displacement activity to blame the media um, for, for, for things. A lot of the phenomena I've been talking about apply as much to politicians as they do to the media. When you complain about a London-centric or English-centric approach, that's quintessentially true of the political class as it is of the media class. 
I'll um, give an example of that. I, I, for five years, chaired the advisory panel of the Economic and Social Research Council um, Constitution and Devolution Project, run by a guy called Charlie Jeffrey, who's now in Edinburgh, and it had very, very strong Welsh representation, um, um, very vocal and um, uh, strong. And we met in Cardiff, we met in Belfast, we met in uh, Edinburgh, and we met in London. And one of the things was to try and get the message over Westminster and Whitehall about the constitutional developments. And I say this is a, effectively the first devolution parliament or parliaments. Um, there was zero interest of Westminster in what was going on. Um, all right, there is a, there is a still is um, a Welsh Select Committee of Welsh members. I do regard that's partly a displacement activity. Same is true of Scotland and Northern Ireland, given where the actual power lies nowadays. But anyway, um, but there was zero interest. That again, there was the feeling they've got the devolution, we don't have to bother any longer. So I don't think it's just a media thing, it's a political thing. But I say I'm not pessimistic for two reasons. Um, one is a fundamental political one. Um, and th again, it comes back to my point of trying to blame the media for problems. Um, devolution Wales is actually rather a vibrant and developing process. Now, I know there have been stops and starts, but no one would say now it's uninteresting or it's not um, going um, developing in very interesting directions and, and, and resulting in increase in power and influence um, around here and uh, up the road. Um, I, I would fully accept what's actually happening here is largely ignored in London, but why in a sense do you care about that? Um, you're actually succeeding and doing some strong, successful things. Um, I could see there are problems, and I'll come to that in a minute, about relationships with constituents who feel, you know, when I read the sun or whatever, I don't hear about what's happening here. Although, of course, decreasing numbers of people get their news in, in that form. But don't underrate the actual political achievement of what's happened and is still happening. And there's a tendency to be too negative about that um, and to feel, oh, because we're not being um, reported, um, we're not succeeding. And I think that, 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 that's unnecessarily pessimistic and negative. The second point, and the key one in media terms, is uh, the growth of the internet and social media. Because as I say, there is no way the, the London-based newspapers are suddenly going to increase coverage of Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland. This is not going to happen, full stop. There is no way, given the commercial pressures they're under, um, since I left the Times three years ago, they've had two waves of redundancies, they're into heavy cost-cutting. Um, the same is true of every other paper. Um, the idea that they're going to take on correspondence there, forget it. Um, the, uh, nor is there going to be a sudden change in attitudes by news editors and news executives um, who, on the whole, the, their visits to Wales will be limited to um, um, getting off the train and walking 100 yards to, to watch a rugby match um, with a corporate sponsor. Um, <laughs> I don't think that gives them quite the flavour of Wales. Uh, and I don't think I'm exaggerating that remark. But I'm po positive because the internet and social media provides a chance to communicate directly at low cost. The startup costs of it are extremely low. There's both an individual opportunity for AMs to do, to do that, um, and also a collective one for the assembly. And um, you can generate your own media activity. Also, uh, I, I wonder how many AMs use Twitter. I mean, I think it's transformed in the last two or three years political coverage. It's very interesting. Um, two, two things. One very recent one. Last night, the, um, um, uh, the attack, the vicious attack in Greenwich. That was initially largely communicated by Twitter. Um, and it came over what was happening, the statements from uh, passers-by. I mean, it was direct. The actual coverage was actually done by people with their mobile phones. I mean, it was the most extraordinary aspect of coverage. We knew far more about it on social media before anything official happened. Admittedly, all right, it was, in, it, it was in a big city. The same would happen if you had it um, <coughs> somewhere here, if you, if, if you did that. It was directly covered in that way. The response of David Cameron, who's in Paris, and Miliband, who was in Germany and has now come back, as, as David Cameron has, the response of, uh, of, of uh, Theresa May as Home Secretary, immediately was on Twitter. That produces direct communication. I also remember when we had the government reshuffle um, last September, Downing Street chose to, chose to communicate that by Twitter. I mean, it, it has totally changed methods of communication. I, at my institute, we, we've had three public events in, in four days, um, and we communicate that by Twitter, and it spreads the message, and one just cannot 
um, uh, exaggerate the impact of that. It is absolutely fundamental. That is a low-cost one. We could all do it. I suppose there's a hashtag there. You know, virtually every event one goes to now, the key initial question is, what's the, what, what's the hashtag on it? So I think there's a big opportunity there. OK, it can be infuriating, trivial. It also has the, has the fault, and it's one which um, I know the broadcasters are very aware of, is that the, most, the, the latest development is the most significant. I mean, I always get infuriated by breaking news. When breaking news happens, the assumption is breaking you know, the, the latest tidbit is more significant than something that happened half an hour ago. Um, and that's one of the perennial problems. And it's one which exercised Richard and it's exercised Peter uh, at the BBC of how do you handle that. And it's a really fundamental one, which has been made much worse by the, the other means of communication. But it, the, 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 there is a chance to express views, to draw attention to new developments. Of course, not everyone uses social media, but one can get... Uh, 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 that is changing rapidly. It is not just a generational thing. Um, uh, the, there's lots of evidence now of it spreading amongst, you know, I'm 64, about a generation of myself and older. Of course there are social class aspects to it, naturally there are, um, and there are problems, but they're much less than they were, and they're steadily decreasing. And with public authorities, I know squeeze public authorities, promoting use of the internet, and so on and so forth. Um, it, and the, the distribution aspects of it are much more complicated than they often appear to be. Um, it's not necessarily to do with ethnic background or anything like that. It, it's not entirely to do with social class. There are generational aspects, but it, 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 it's, it's an effective means of, of communicating. Um, also, the risks, I mean, collectively, for the Assembly, what do you choose to publicise? I mean, it's very interesting in Parliament. I mean, Peter and I know that from... I used to chair the Hansard Society, and Peter was a very valued member of the Council, which he's still on, is when Parliament, which is actually at Westminster Parliament, has has made big strides in its communication ex externally, largely thanks to one man called John Pullinger, who's the most fantastic man who's director of information there. Um, and, of course, there are risks there. Once you choose to highlight one thing rather than another thing, you always get someone on your back and complaining. But it's possible to do with imagination and flair, which they've done, and, 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 it, and it is difficult to do. But it, it is possible. Also, um, in the next conference you're going to have with bloggers and so on, I think that there is a... Uh, real scope there to, to um, draw attention to issues via blogging. Now, all right, you can say that that is also the uh, megaphone. It is the megaphone. But it's also possible to have, without being too pie, um, public interest blogging. What's interesting is some university sites, and Cardiff University, I know, is very innovative uh, in some of its public responsibilities uh, on that. Um, and also, you know, other universities around Wales. Um, uh, can raise issues, get them debated. And there's, a, uh, w w there's an interesting incentive on that now. There's what's known as the research excellence uh, exercise, which is basically the, the future funding of universities in the second half of this decade. That's now going on. I, I, I was involved in it before I, I stepped down because of my current job. And one of the big tests there is impact. So there's a wonderful lever on politicians and everyone else to get universities involved in this area. Um, because the more they can show that they're stimulating public debate, the more it impresses the um, university funding people and the more money will result. Um, I'm not sure that's what Hefke would necessarily um, approve of what I say, but it's, it's undoubtedly true. The more you can demonstrate impact, and one of the ways of demonstrating impact is to stimulate public debate on what happens in political discussion. There are also public interest bodies related to charities. And the key point about this is cheap. I was not talking about big expenses. It's not creating. It's when I started out... You know, the, the big um, hot metal presses, all that stuff. I, mean, I, I was back in the... Uh, I started out really in the old days of it all, which was very expensive, had barriers to entry, um, obviously affected by um, union-restricted practices, but also just by the simple uh, nature of the equipment. With the internet and social media, those have largely disappeared. So I'm positive on that. I think it, be, it is not helpful to focus on the mainstream written media, because you're not going to get change there. They've got problems enough. I mean, within, a, I think, um, um, a relatively short period of time, the majority readership of most papers will be via the internet and various social media sites. I mean, someone's here saying, oh, they looked at the Times Scottish edition via the Times app, I mean, um, which would just have been impossible uh, two or three years ago. The technological change there democratizes it with 
the theme is democratic deficit. Well, that's a way of addressing the democratic deficit through new technology. Now, the danger there is it makes you sound wild eyed and geeky and so on. Um, I think even my closest, well, actually, my closest friends were certainly not saying the geek. Um, but I think there's potential there. So, my, my suggestion for today's discussion would be not to focus too much on conventional written media. Well, I don't think there's a realistic chance of change, but to nurture and embrace the internet and social media, which can achieve the much broader debate. And of course, it's, not, it's, a, it, it's broader in every sense. It's a debate which isn't controlled by a limited number of people. It's open to everyone. Now, when you have it open to everyone, it's raucous. It can be raucous and so on. But it can also result in informed discussion. In many respects, I think public discussion on many issues is much better than it's ever been. Um, it isn't through the conventional means. Thank you very much. Um, what, what do you think of, what do you think this phrase democratic deficit really means? What is, the, what is that problem? I think the, what is meant by it, um, and uh, it's very much a politician's term, uh, and I feel it's, we're being ignored. Um, some of it's obviously to do with turnout. Um, and that's often cited as the main phenomenon, but I think one can exaggerate that, um, the, ter the, the turnout issue. Um, the, ter the change in turnout is as much to do with changing um, uh, social composition um, and the breakdown of traditional class allegiances and so on. I mean, um, I, I think a lot of the turnout is a, a change in um, party identification, social identification. So one can exaggerate that as a, a, a phenomenon. I think what is meant by is a fragmentation of the, of, of, of the media, a fragmentation of response, and the sense that politicians now find it much harder to get the message through. I mean, give a couple of examples, which I think are what politicians think of the democratic deficit. Um, when I was growing up in the 60s, the bulletins you controlled and so on had a very substantial slice. I mean, if you took the main BBC and B main ITV bulletin, I mean, you'll have the figures to hand and I won't, um, a very high percentage of the adult viewing audience. A third of that now, if you're lucky. Um, and that is through a change in people's viewing habits, a change in people's leisure habits. Um, it's not meaning to say that they're totally ignorant of information, although there is a problem there, um, but they are taking information in, in wholly different ways. I can find, I mean, I, I would have regarded it, I mean, I did actually watch, I, I had an event at the Institute last night, I didn't get home for about nine o'clock, so I did watch the 10 o'clock um, BBC News because of Woolwich and I wanted to see what's happened. But I got my primary news on Twitter about what had happened on that. Um, and that would be true, I think, of, well, the evidence is true of a lot of people. But I think the democratic deficit in this context is meant the, I think in two traditional terms, of the number of people who are viewing the main news programmes or reading papers. Uh, when, and I think it doesn't sufficiently take into account that people take in news about public affairs in many, many different ways now. And, and just very briefly to, to follow up on that, if the, if the concern then is about a lack of political engagement by the public mm. because of you know, the normal channels of finding out about politics and, and civic issues as is, is fragmenting, what's the risk? If we have a disengaged public, what's the, what's the risk? I think there are obviously high, uh, 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 high risks, but when you talk about disengaged public, <coughs> it's what are they disengaged from? Uh, they may be disengaged from the debates um, uh, uh, by AMs. They're not necessarily disengaged from issues affecting them directly. Are they disengaged from the introduction of universal credit? Are they disengaged from um, what's happening in, in the health service or education in Wales? I very much doubt it. Um, it passionately affects them. They express their interest in different ways. Um, um, certainly. The evidence, um, Peter and I well, know well, the Hansel Society has an audit of political engagement. What it shows is there is no significant um, drop-off in interest in politics in the broader sense of public affairs. What there is, is a, a drop-off in interest in mainstream political discussion. That's the most significant thing. And of course there's a generational aspect to that there, but I, there is no real evidence of a decline in interest in public issues. It's how it's expressed, and that's why I say when the politicians talk about democratic deficit, they say people are less interested in what we're doing. There's much less evidence of the public being less interested in issues affecting them. And I think that's why they disconnect. What are the risks? The risks are, in one sense, extremism um, um, uh, and political violence, although I still think the, the risks of that are quite low in the UK. I mean, someone stupidly said last night that what had happened in Woolwich was you know, made Britain like Baghdad. 
Uh, well, no, um, we don't have 20 or 30 people killed a day in car bombs um, um, in any brief city. And um, even the worst of uh, Northern Ireland, it wasn't at that scale. Um, so I think there's a danger of getting things out of proportion in that way. There are dangers of extremism. I think there's a dangers of, um, and this is where the interaction is very difficult, of inflated expectation. What worries me most about, perhaps another expression of democratic deficit, is because of the way politicians talk and the way um, the, um, it's presented in the media, often conventional media, is there are in totally inflated expectations. I mean, Labour came in, in in 97 saying you've got five days to save the health service. Rubbish. Uh, uh, the, Labour did make a difference to the health service over 13 years, but sure, but it, it wasn't five days to save it. You're talking about differences at the margin which are cumulative over a period. The same is true of a lot of promises which raise expectations artificially and produce cynicism. Now, some of that's pr a product of the media environment, campaigning environment. That worries me a bit more. Okay, let's open it out. Who'd, who'd like to, uh, to start us off? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether you thought, because of the news deficit, you've got a better government in 2007 because the, um, in comparison to the one in 2010, uh, coalition government, and because there wasn't the glare of publicity in 24-hour uh, news channels um, covering the negotiations, um, so I was just you know, thinking perhaps we've got a better government with the Pike and Labour coalition compared to the uh, Westminster coalition because people could actually hammer down what you were saying just now about it wasn't over five days, it happened over a number of weeks. Well, I think, I, I think it's very interesting. I mean, there are lots of interesting points on that, um, which are slightly, some of which are way outside our, our thing to, this morning. I think what there is, and that's true of all three, I mean, let's say Wales and Scotland, because Northern Ireland is so different because um, of the structure there. There's an acceptance that politics is a multi-party phenomenon. All right, you, you, it, Wales has varied between all kinds of combinations since 1999, and, uh, uh, as we're well aware. But there's an awareness that the political settlement will involve a number of parties interacting in various ways, sharing power, being a minority, maybe coalition, all that stuff. Um, and that's an awareness. Still at Westminster, there's an enormous shock. The, my, 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 my feeling is on, on, on that, that there is still a majority view amongst many politicians, and certainly many in the Westminster-based media, that 2010 was an aberration, which the, um, and, and that's certainly the view of most Tory MPs. I mean, Tory MPs regard it as a horrendous mistake, and why did David Cameron doing it? Rather than realising that that um, if they had a minority government, um, they'd have been able to do probably a third of what they've actually been able to do thanks to the Lib Dem coalition. But it's an aspect of politics which is still majoritarian. In Wales and Scotland, the political culture accepts a much more complicated interaction, which I think makes your point absolutely valid. But I think that's to do with the political culture and the expectations, where actually Wales and Scotland are way ahead of Westminster in that way. We'll have to see what happens in the next election. I mean, we could have a majority government, who knows? But I think the, the, what part of the tensions at the centre in the last three years have been because people have regarded an aberration as something wrong when th there's a very different political system because of the existence of PR and it conditions people to behave in different ways. Even if you have a single party government, the, the uh, behaviour and expectations are different. Okay, uh, more questions and if you could just give us an indication of, of who you are and where you're from as well. Yeah. Uh, behind you, it's at the, at the very back, yeah. Hi, uh, Matt Dix from the National Assembly for Wales. Uh, just to pick up on two points. First, about social uh, media. Um, would you accept that in some way social media and the traffic on social media is initially driven by traditional media platforms? So, for example, uh, Nick Robinson will tweet, and because of the number of followers he has, that will create a momentum behind debate on social network. Again, that exacerbates the problem in Wales because we don't have that traditional media platform reporting that and people following those traditional uh, media uh, reports, etc. So we're, we're down on that one. Um, the other point you make about um, not changing UK newspapers, um, effectively you're saying there that a fundamental UK institution is by its nature Anglo-centric, which was the key argument for, or the raison d'etre for devolution in 1997, and that you're effectively saying that we in Wales are just going to be ignored by UK institutions. So 
are you sort of making an initial case for independence? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't ask which party you represent. Um, I think your first point is a really good one um, on um, the link between traditional media and social media. That, I mean, it's both true of internet sites. You know, one of the most successful internet sites, um, they're linked to newspapers or the, or the BBC. And the BBC is, you know, um, and that's why there's so many arguments about the BBC, BBC site, particularly as more um, newspapers go behind firewalls and charge for access. The, the arguments between the BBC and the broadcasters, including my saintly former proprietor, um, who, as we know, is totally disinterested in, in just sort of uh, um, view of such things. He tweets himself. He tweets himself. So I guess yes. it's trouble. Huh? Not something which is entirely approved of by those who work for him. <laughs> um, um, perhaps there ought to be an age bar on tweeting. But anyway, um, the, the, but no, you've got a good point there. And, and I, I fully accept that. There is, there is I mean, it's a classic thing in any market. I mean, the dominant player is going to have that. But in a sense, you know, a stronger Welsh voice would get a following. I mean, there are alternative voices which come through. One of the most interesting things of, of tweeting, and indeed of, 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 of political websites, is how new voices have entered. I mean, one of the most successful phenomenon has been actually on the right, not the left, and it's interesting why it hasn't really developed on the left, is conservative home website. If you want to understand Tory politics, you read that rather than the Telegraph. And it's very interesting, the person who edited conservative home, Tim Montgomery, has now taken, moved over to the Times to edit their opinion pages. Very interesting move, that. So it is possible to be new entry in, 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 in that way. Um, and I, so I'm not totally pursuing. Your second point, um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, I mean, it's an example of the asymmetry of the, the UK. I mean, you're, you're making that. I'm making a, both a commercial competitive point, what I think the behavior of London-based newspapers will be, and it's whistling in the wind or whatever metaphor you'd like to use to expect them to change. What I'm saying is, look at alternatives, and alternatives are now available. If I was having this discussion back in 1999, I'd be much more pessimistic. I'd be more negative. I think there are opportunities there, but it requires a degree of self-confidence. And the fact that devolution is a success and is making an impact um, shows, you know, perhaps, I, mean, I, I understand I mean, Richard rightly asked me about democratic deficit worries and so on. I think there's a, there, there are valid worries here, but um, one could be too negative about it. Okay. Um, well, I'm here representing a, a new digital thing that an art centre, but in a previous life, um, I was a, a councillor for 22 years and was leader of one of the Welsh councils. And my question really is, um, having been actively involved in politics for about 30 years, when 30 years ago, there were lots of opportunities to have, um, you know, real discussion and debate about issues and not looking so much at the short term, but really analysing the problems and, and issues that we should be looking at in depth. And what I've found over the last few years um, is that the, the opportunity for real, uh, serious political discussion doesn't seem there as it was a few years ago. It's more short-termism and... Um, I wonder if you find that as the media as well. You know, there's not that um, uh, people are worrying about the next elections all the time and they're not actually looking at the serious issues that they should be looking at in the way that they should. And I don't know whether you feel... I feel that as a politician, yeah. um, but I just wonder whether the media feel that as well. I, I think... I mean, I, it's good. I mean, I think the problem is, whilst I did say that I think there is a... In terms of getting space in papers and more fo focus on personality split and all that stuff, you could still get um, some very good discussions on long-term issues. Uh, I don't necessarily think the political system is very attuned to tackling those. I mean, it's one, it goes back to the point I was making earlier, one result of the coalition in Westminster, there's now a kind of policy blight. Um, very little is going to be decided for the next two years. The individual parties may produce lots of ideas. And um, because of the way the coalition is at present. But I, I, I you know, I think, remember, I mean, let me think, two or three issues. Um, two of them are English issues, but they're important ones. Um, one is um, High Speed Rail 2. There's been a really proper discussion of that, which is a very big English issue, and not just a London issue by definition. The length of connection to Birmingham and um, up to um, the North East and North West. There's a very good discussion there. It's not just a NIMBY discussion. Um, of energy needs. Um, there's a big discussion on, on the failures of past governments of both parties to make provision uh, on long-term energy, which is, I think, well discussed. 
Um, I, I, I think there's some, I don't know, that obviously has um, big consequences in Wales. So I think there are, um, um, air co airport capacity, um, I know it's a sore topic, um, you know, the Welsh Government's taken over Cardiff Airport and so on, um, and I think that's a quite interesting symbolic issue, actually, um, of having an airport which is strong, say, as, um, you know, I mean, you contrast Edinburgh and Cardiff airports and you realise there's some catch-up. Um, but I think, no, long-term long issues can be discussed, but they, I, I would agree with you to the extent that you've got, to pick and, you, you, you've, you've got to pick and choose where you find the discussion of them. But it's not that ignored by the media, but they can be overshadowed by some of the short-term, shorter-term issues. And what my concern is rather more that the big issues are discussed, and in many respects better than they were in the past, but the second-order things, which are important to some people, um, a lot of people, but in, in segmented ways, you know, they're important to one group, run another group, they tend to get squeezed out. But also, and again, the advantage of the internet is you can have really good debates on big issues um, um, away from traditional forum. And also, they can be accessed. I mean, I, I, I say run this policy institute, you know, our pri prime aim is to influence government or governments and politicians or servants. Well, we, we can also stimulate debates by what we do on the internet. I mean, we have a conscious policy with my communications director and my guy, guy who runs the um, internet to stimulate debate in that way. And we can reach people, we get responses in ways which would have been unheard of um, 10 years ago. But Peter, is part of the issue that the media, all the media, tend to address politics through the sort of who's up, who's down, mm. Westminster prism, and what you're saying is that people are very engaged in political issues, but they don't happen to look at them through that kind of, you know, parliamentary party political prism. And, and is, is the media perhaps falling behind a little bit how the public, you know, what choose to engage in, in political issues? I think there, I, I agree with that. I mean, the classic there is reshuffles, where the um, political coverage gets absolutely uh, enthralled, uh, and I'm sure there was real excitement last September here when uh, Cheryl Gillan was replaced by Dan Jones, and it moved people in the valleys. But, um, um, oh, or perhaps not. Um, but the, uh, ah, I think there is that, absolutely. Because personalities are really identifiable and so on. But I think the, one of the real failings is on these things, that the inner political group, and I see this as being detached now, it's quite interesting. I see this being slightly detached at present, is that some of the coverage of personalities, I mean, you know, Nadine Doris isn't the most important person in British politics. The fact she got the Tory whip back is uh, there's a, a bit of party management to try, well, unsuccessfully to try and shut her up um, and try and prevent her going to UKIP. It's not actually the most fundamental thing facing the UK about its relations with Europe. And there, is, there are dangers in that. And, and you know, the colourful personalities will get more coverage. And I think there are dangers. But what I'm saying is there are alternative ways the issues can be discussed. OK, we've got time for one or two more questions for Peter before we, we move on. James. James Stewart from the uh, University of South Wales. Um, you talked about the decline in turnout as if it was a single thing, but I think it is important to address the question of the relatively lower turnout in assembly elections and whether mm -hmm. that has got anything to do with the lack of information reaching the electorate because they're reading London newspapers with the problem that you've identified and whether that can be addressed in the ways you described. But I mean, there is a problem there that the turnout is low, which is an indication of a democratic deficit. Now, I... I yeah, I mean, I, I, I say I, I'm cautious about extrapolating from turnout to, to democratic deficit. I think, I think it's a phenomenon of it. I mean, I don't, I don't say there's no connection, but I think there's a danger of exaggerating that as an indicator. But on your basic point, I can see exactly what you're saying. That, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't want to quite pass the buck to, to uh, Peter, but I will partly, because the way most people get information about elections isn't necessarily through newspapers, it's through TV and by use of social media. I mean, the, the they have to be interested in what the assembly is doing to care about them. Well, they've got, to be they've got to believe that the issues the assembly is looking at matter to them. Yeah. That's the key point. It's the, it's the importance of the issues that they face. I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, let's take an English example. Um, one of the reasons there's low turnout in English, most of the local, local government, is people believe local councils have practically no power. Um, it's only when they believe they have power and authority they'll turn out, and there's a correlation between the two. Um, but I, I think it's partly responsibility of politicians, um, AMs and so on, to say this is what really matters. Now, I accept that you know, the absence and the problems within conventional print media make it more difficult. I don't deny that at all, which, but I say there are alternatives to do that, um, to stimulate that. I'm, I'm not denying the problem. On the turnout issue, 
I think that there are quite a lot of longer term social trends which led to disengagement. Some of them, are, you could say, are unhealthy, but I think one can exaggerate the turnout aspect of it. I mean, after all, high turnout, you can go back, go back 40, 50 years, go back to when Jim Callaghan represented his seat. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the turnouts were. I mean, his last, la last um, uh, election would have been 2000, uh, sorry, um, 1983, and he retired in 1970. Um, I'm sure it was much, much higher than the turnout in 2010. But that reflected a lot to do with the social makeup and, um, uh, of parties then and so on. I mean, there was a more automatic voting and so on. I, I think that's why one can slightly exaggerate. But I, I don't deny it t entirely. I, I just put a caveat in. Peter, thank you very much. You, you've passed the buck on to uh, uh, the other Peter, so I think we'll, we'll, we'll follow that cue. But thank you very much indeed, Mr. Lippert. Um, what I was going to do is just talk about the... Uh, the democratic deficit, try and get a definition of it, put a question mark against it. The, the day doesn't have a question mark, it's an assertion, but I think we need to ask whether we really think, think it's for real. Uh, it's a slightly strange thing to do because otherwise, if it's not, then um, what are we doing? Spending a whole day on it, um, on something that uh, may be a fiction. Um, look at the BBC's response uh, to it, and then I'll turn to some thoughts, some observations uh, on the assembly and, and how it works and, uh, and how it's perceived. Taking the de demographic, democratic deficit in its broad sense, what do we mean? Well, in other parts of the world, we mean when people can't vote or when they don't have a free vote, when they're not safe to vote. Um, and a huge amount of work goes on in, in unsafe parts of the world to, to try and improve things. That's not what we mean in, in, in Western Europe. What we tend to mean is engagement, involvement, and understanding. The case um, for there being a substantial, significant democratic deficit, in a way, appears to be a slam dunk case. The, the, what we've just been talking about, turnout, and party membership. Party membership is in... Uh, serious trouble in, uh, in numbers and we all know the, the statistics about the, uh, the charities that have more members than our political parties. Um, the turnout in elections here at the Assembly uh, never got, has never got above the 46% of the very first election in 99 and the last two has been in the low 40s. That's significantly less than the uh, general election turnout which across the UK uh, varies. It went up at the last election in 2010 to around, I think, 64, 65%, um, but is nowhere near its historic highs when, as Peter was saying, in a way, tribal turnout led to uh, you getting numbers in the 80s. So there's a very strong case there that in terms of that formal relation, the very formal relationship with politics, uh, things have uh, turned for the worse. And that's in terms of party membership and turnout. Against that, however, and we've already started to touch on some of these things, there's a host of indicators which uh, are far more positive. The, if you ask any uh, Assembly member or a member of Parliament what level of interaction they have with their constituents, and they will tell you the same thing, that because of email, um, the number of contacts they have with individual constituents is vastly higher than it was a few years ago. In fact, it's unmanageably high in many cases. So you try this experiment of writing to your AM or your MP and see what bounce back you get on the email. And really, it's usually quite a long list of uh, reasons why they kind of would rather you didn't. Um, maybe you don't live in their constituency. Have you tried talking to your lo uh, local councillor? Uh, I'm very busy, I get a lot of emails, I deal with them in order, I do, your email is very important to me, I will get back to you. It's actually a kind of cry for help from people who are overwhelmed by the number of contacts they are getting from their constituents. And that's so for most uh, MPs. I know of one MP, there may be others who do this, who actually, uh, their bounce back says, um, if, if you care about what you're writing to me about, uh, put it in a letter, here's my address, and I'll write back to you. Uh, and that's uh, a, a way of cutting down, because most people then don't go, go and hit print 
or write it out and put a stamp on it and put it through the letterbox. So um, there's a huge amount of contact that goes on. Um, we've talked about uh, t uh, tweeting and email activism. There are other indicators too. The growth of youth parliaments. There are, there are several different kinds of youth parliaments. Citizenship education in schools, where there was, I mean, the phrase was only invented in recent years. All these things are going on. Um, and people's awareness of news, well, away from broadcasting, look at the, um, look, look the take-up of free newspapers. In any big city, you're travelling on the bus or the tube, um, and most people around you, when they're not twiddling uh, with their smartphones, are reading the f the, the, uh, a free sheet or a bought newspaper. Um, so there's a huge amount of contact. The audiences to television news are... Uh, the, main the main bulletins, the 6 and the 10, are down on what they were, but they haven't gone away. They're still in the uh, multiple millions. They're still huge audiences. The, um, view the viewership of BBC Parliament, uh, BBC Parliament is a niche channel with a narrow remit. It's niche's remit, but its audience isn't. Um, when we started measuring the audience to BBC Parliament, we were getting 700,000 reach in a month, and that was the first time it was measured by Barb, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. Um, and I showed the numbers around, and people thought, well, that's actually, you know, given how pretty austere uh, the presentation is, if those of you who are familiar with BBC Parliament, you know what I mean by austere. Um, that's not bad. And then we hit a million. I thought, that's fantastic. It's absolutely brilliant feeling. And then gradually, it's, picked, it's gone up, and, up, and it's now, as of the, la the average, the rolling average for the last eight months has been two million. I don't claim that we'll hit three, but we're now at a monthly average. In fact, every month this year, we, our monthly reach has been two million. Um, and that's for a channel that uncompromisingly does institutional politics, not politics in the broadest sense, just institutional politics as its core subject. Um, these are... Uh, terrific. And if you think about the last general election and how many people watched the, um, the, the prime ministerial debates, um, ITV staged the first one, Sky the second, BBC the third, we showed all, all three. I think the number, is the cumulative number of, for people watching some significant part of one or all of those debates, was it was certainly above 20 million, it may even have been as high as 25 million. It was at least getting on for half the electorate. That's fantastic numbers. So lots of grounds uh, to be less pessimistic than you would expect me to be based on turnout and membership alone. However... The third leg of this is knowledge and understanding. Do I think that this has led to a kind of upwelling of knowledge and understanding of our politics? And no, I don't. The correspondence I get um, from viewers to BBC Parliament at times makes me want to cry because people don't, some people don't understand anything about our institutional politics and uh, ask the most mad questions. And I deal with that and think, oh my goodness, where do I start? Where do I start in terms of dealing? Now, I get also some fantastic quality feedback and feedback that we can act on and do things about. But I am constantly shocked at the uh, low level of understanding um, of, of, of institutional politics, both UK-wide uh, and national. The audit of political engagement that the Hans Hansard Society does, of, of which I'm a trustee, uh, is a very thorough trawl through this territory. Uh, it came out last week, th uh, this year's. It's a large survey. Um, it's very well done. It is the most authoritative, I think, in this territory. Um, and just to give you two or three sort of key points from it, 55% um, of the public agree that politics and government seem so complicated that a person like me cannot really understand what is going on despite the level of political debate about Europe currently, 57% of the public are unable to identify that British members of the European Parliament are directly elected by British voters, despite the debate on the House of Lords. A third of the public 
don't know that we don't elect, elect members of the House of Lords. 39% don't know that government and parliament are not the same thing. Three out of 10 think 16 is the minimum age of voting. And almost half the population wish or claim they wish they had learned more about politics and how our democracy works at school. So just some headline figures from that. It's pretty grim and it's not getting any better. And the BBC's own internal uh, surveys and polling and material I'm not actually able to quote from uh, directly in the numbers all backs it up that um, ask the question, do you feel confident about, would you feel confident about explaining to, uh, to a friend about, and it's the simplest things like what's opposition or you know, about what is parliament, what's an assembly. People shy away from that and, and, and really don't know. So I think we can accept that in terms of knowledge and understanding, there is a democratic deficit. So what's the... Um, BBC's response to this. There are members of the audience who are here from ITV Wales, so I'm hoping that either they can feel free to interrupt me or come back at the end of this and chip in with, with, with what you'd like to say on this. But for the BBC, let's talk about the um, dedicated coverage, the dedicated political coverage uh, first. We've got the Wales Report with Hugh Edwards, uh, which um, is made by an indie for the BBC, made by Wales & Co., um, replace Dragon's Eye, uh, has a very good slot and gets a good audience, um, also shows on BBC Parliament. Sunday Politics uh, Wales, 20-minute uh, edition, uh, unsurprisingly, on Sundays. AMPM, one edition now a week, not two, on BBC Two Wales. There's the uh, blocks of output on BBC Parliament, where you show First Minister's questions at the same uh, on the same day, late evening. We have a th three-hour block on Saturday afternoons, so this Saturday we'll have First Minister's questions followed by the Queen's speech debate from yesterday. Um, we also showed um, not just the Prime Ministerial debates, but the Welsh leaders' debates that um, were very kindly ITV Wales and Sky uh, lent us their programmes as well as the BBC programme, so we had all three to show on the channel. On Radio 4, we have a dedicated slot in, in Yesterday in Parliament on Radio 4 Longwave, uh, reporting on First Minister's questions um, e e each, uh, w each Wednesday morning on Radio 4. Radio Wales, all, right, all through the uh, year, has got uh, Vaughan Roderick's Sunday Supplement. Um, Radio Cymru, Aubrey, also with, uh, uh, with Vaughan Roderick. Uh, BBC Cymru Wales on S4C has C499 um, and we have uh, our own uh, Democracy Live uh, which shows all of the plenary sessions, many of the, commi <coughs> many of the committees both in English and in Welsh uh, and then lots of supporting material as well. So what have the Romans ever done for us? I mean that's the question isn't it? I mean that, that's the... Um, uh, the, from uh, Monty Python, the kind of, uh, you know, that sense of that huge long list and what have the Romans ever done for us. And that's just the dedicated coverage, to po dedicated to politics, because what I've left out of that is the most important thing, which is um, the mainstream uh, news coverage, because politics isn't something that just happens in an institutional box. It's something that's just part of our lives and the, the, the best way of reporting health stories is going to usually going to be not through speeches but through examples on the ground and so um, we, we have all of the BBC Wales coverage of, uh, of, of politics in the broad sense and the viewing figures and the listening figures are sensationally good and Wales today gets um, more than 30% share of the audience um, in its slot at 6.30. And the 6.30 slot is the best watched part of BBC One um, of any kind of programme. Not just, I'm not just comparing news with news, of anything. The Wales whale today outperforms the English slots at that time by several percentage points. It's, it's terrifically successful. Good Morning Wales just reported figures of 84,000 listening uh, be, uh, between, I think, 8 and 8.30 in the morning. And that's up um, 25, 26,000 this last quarter. So 
it's quite easy just to beat, it, beat ourselves up or, or believe that it's all going the way of um, Twitterdom and forget what's in front of our eyes, that between newspapers, free sheets, and the broadcast me traditional broadcast media, we are still pulling in very large audiences, and in some cases, those are growing audiences. So we haven't cracked it in terms of people's understanding and knowledge, but exposure, well, there, there are plenty of opportunities, and, the, and many of those opportunities are being taken um, for ex exposure to this kind of politics. If we look at um, the King report from uh, five years ago, it was highly critical of what the BBC was doing. And it's critical on two counts. One was accuracy, and the other was representation. Now, accuracy uh, was about the fact that, um, that London-based um, programs, uh, news programs, were not taking the trouble to identify when policies were um, England only, England and Wales only, and not Scotland, and so forth. The, the language was only occasionally being used. It was being used sporadically rather than systematically. Um, and I wouldn't say that problem has completely gone away because it is a difficult one. This is a complex area. Um, but there is a very high level of compliance now by... Uh, by writers, by sub-editors, in terms of getting that script line out consistently um, and aiming for 100% of the time, but it's not far, and it's not far off. So, because we understood that the problem that that accuracy is a sort of sister to truthfulness, if we're not actually telling people which what belongs to where, then it's not a true picture of what's going on. So we've taken it very seriously indeed. The other side to the uh, King report was on representation. Was, was uh, Wales, was Scotland being represented adequately in terms of its policies um, in the network media? And, you know, I've got examples, and, and I think it is. I mean, uh, Betsan it does a regular uh, conference call with the uh, network editors in London to make sure that the Welsh stories... That, uh, that have a UK-wide significance, and we'll come back to what that means in a second, um, are, are part of the output. Um, so we have um, the, Sil the Silk Commission, um, and that was reported on, on the network bulletins in terms of tax raising and policing. Lots of coverage of the ongoing uh, rumbling disputes over GCSEs, um, and that's... Uh, and, and, and other aspects of education policy. Um, a lot of coverage of health, and one example I've got um, is of the interview with a, a Welsh cancer patient who'd started to rent a flat in Manchester to get uh, access to drugs under the English NHS. Uh, environment and farming, we have the, the uh, milk prices um, and uh, it, uh, arguments over the uh, ele electricity pylons, horse meat story, and uh, police and crime commissioners, as stories that have been recently on network bulletins. I think what's interesting there is, as well as this, it, this is not just about um, the straightforward reporting of Welsh stories for a Welsh audience, but it's, there's something a lot more complicated going on. Because increasingly, uh, public policy, health and education, is being seen as what happens in Wales is a kind of laboratory test for what might happen in England, and vice versa. Both, both parts, and Scotland too, all these different parts of the United Kingdom are actually now increasingly overtly seeing themselves as, uh, as, as testing grounds. And uh, the education secretary, Michael Gove, has made that absolutely explicit this week in what he said about... Um, uh, about uh, education policy and qualifications that, um, that, that, that England, Wales, Scotland um, are going their own way. So these are really interesting stories for all the audience because, uh, and, 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 and in terms of the political dimension, I mean, it, it is increasingly being picked up on. I mean, the, the Prime Minister uh, is in increasingly using uh, PMQs, Prime Minister's <coughs> questions, to 
um, have, a, have a crack at government policy in Wales and saying, and making the, and, and he's saying it's not just different in Wales, it's worse. And so there's every good reason why we would want to do more of this kind of reporting um, as, as this um, uh, new politics develops. I said I'd talk about the, um, the assembly and how it works. Um, the deputy presiding officer has popped out. Are there any um, uh, assembly members here? Okay, good. Yeah. Right. You're so safe. <laughs> right, what we're going to do is... They may be lying. What, we're, assembly we're, member lying? We're almost <laughs> in a hemicycle, almost. So let's recreate the atmosphere... Of a, of a normal debate, and everybody get out your laptops now. And if you haven't got a laptop, your, your, um, your smartphone, log on, put your head down, and start typing. Because I'm afraid that's actually, to the audience, what it looks like. I absolutely understand why assembly members want to use their time profitably and work and be able to carry on their work and get information and deal with it while they're in the chamber. But it's pretty grim to watch because they don't appear to be engaged. Their heads are down, there's a lot of typing going on, and you wonder whether kind of they're there in the space, and if so, as an audience, should I be there? It's... and... and, and I'm a, you know, you haven't followed my instructions. I, I can see you, many of you are still looking at me. So this doesn't really work, does it? But the truth is, if you, I, I, it must be quite, um, quite difficult as an assembly member um, speaking, addressing the chamber, and having very few heads lifted up and most people like that. I think that's a real problem. I'll come back to it. I might have a little suggestion. It's not my business, but I'm going to have a, I have, a, I have a suggestion to make, which I'll come to at the end. Um, let's just think about assembly coverage and whether it's pitched right in terms of what we do with it. Um, last week, it's a really good example. There were two public accounts committee meeting at the same time. There was one in the House of Commons and there was one here. But it's committees with exactly the same titles. One in, the one in the House of Commons was having a crack at, um, at Google over their tax affairs. Um, and that was live um, on the BBC News Channel, and it's going to be on BBC Parliament uh, at a convenient time over this weekend, um, and it's part of our ongoing coverage. We'll have stuff from, um, from the Senate at the weekend too, where something similar was going on with Apple. Here, the Public Accounts Committee was doing a, a local issue of real significance, but very different. It's the Caldicott and Wentluge Levels Internal Drainage Board. Uh, somewhat unfortunately, in one of, in, in one of uh, our headlines referred to uh, as um, problems with the drainage board, which sounds like get your finger in and it'd be all right. But there'd clearly been a huge uh, sort of corporate failure with the uh, Caldicott and Wentluge uh, Drainage Board, and um, that um, Public Accounts Committee was looking into that, and that got uh, was the top story on Democracy Live, uh, and I you know, believe it got appropriate level coverage uh, here in Wales. So horses for courses. There are you know um, we have lots and lots of different media outlets and uh, different ways of pitching this. Um, Let's just talk about the debating style in the, in the chamber and what works really well and what uh, is more problematic. What works really well, um, there are a lot of ministerial statements, there are a lot of urgent questions. It's something that the House of Commons has only just learned to do under this current parliament. Um, but what's great about that is the story of the day is going to be uh, discussed, debated uh, on the floor of the chamber. Uh, terrific. Um, there's, you know, as editor of, I'm also the editor of Today in Parliament uh, on Radio 4, um, and it was a miserable experience when you'd have really important uh, stories with a major political uh, dimension that weren't being discussed um, on the floor of the House. And John Burko, the new speaker, changed all that overnight. It's really great that here you do get that kind of uh, the urgent questions and statements. 
the assembly is famous for its um, gender equality. Uh, a lot of female um, assembly members uh, putting other parliaments to shame. Two minutes. But the bad news, well, I've talked about one, the lack of the inattentive, the apparent inattentiveness of members when they're typing and fiddling at their computers. Uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a problem. Um, speeches um, that are just that. I mean, it wouldn't have been much fun for anybody, um, whatever the merits or demerits of what I've said to you this last few minutes, but if I had come with a typewritten five, six pages, stuck my head down and read them out at you. Reading into the record, it's called. It's not great. So if you have a debate where one person after another just reads out what they've already written, then it's not a debate. It's a succession of speeches. And the unwillingness of members to take interventions from each other, and I appreciate that taking interventions can be scary and go off in all sorts of directions, but the, the, the unwillingness to take interventions, I think, uh, is unfortunate. Uh, something the presiding officer uh, goes on about is uh, members making statements uh, which are meant to be questions but are just, in fact, statements. Um, and what was great was after uh, Peter spoke, um, the questions were all actual questions. Usually at this sort of event, people name-check their organisation and then kind of sit down, um, uh, which is a statement. Um, uh, if you want to do that, that's fine. I can't stop you, but questions are much better. Um, the informal language that people use. Now, it's a matter of taste, but I have to say, it, it doesn't work for me when the speaker in the chamber uh, starts talking about S Simon's just said and David's just said and Kenneth's just said, um, because actually they know who they're talking about, but probably the audience doesn't. And you know, it's to taste whether or not that informality feels right. Um, being a hemicycle, it doesn't have the confrontational uh, style of the House of Commons, but um, that's to taste. What do you want? Do you want confrontation, or do you want a, a, a kind of uh, a, a very, very, very different feel that you get from a hemicycle? Finally, I said I would, um, uh, I'd make a suggestion. My one suggestion is this, that um, during uh, First Minister's questions, that AMs shut their laptops and look up and listen to the debate. And for that period of 45 minutes to an hour, um, don't uh, pick up email or type, or, but just take part of there in the moment in that place. And if that works, um, then they could maybe roll that out to uh, statements and questions as well. I'll stop there, thank you. Peter, thank you very much. In summary, you seem to be saying that um, the BBC has a lot of, um, you know, quite successful output about politics and Welsh politics. Uh, assembly sittings can be a bit dull, uh, and the public have a shocking lack of understanding of politics. So where does the, other than the assembly members sitting up a bit more, where does the problem lie in trying to get that understanding, improve that public understanding? Um, the, I... I clearly have been overly negative. There are some good examples of debates in the chamber. Um, I thought the Queen's speech debate yesterday was good. Um, there, have been, there are others as well, the, uh, organ donation debate. There, you, you can track several, so please don't get me. Uh, I, I, I sure, fear but that... It's the, it's the, it's, okay. just, it's the lack of understanding. Is the I think the problem is this, that um, the, the lack of understanding of institutional politics, the mechanisms of institu institutional po po of politics is really difficult one to crack. People have a willingness to understand politics in the broad sense and how it affects them. There is um, built in a, a, a reluctance to engage with, the, frankly, the hard work of understanding how all the bits and pieces fit together. And it is complicated. We have a fantastically complicated system um, of, of politics. Um, we have a quite staggering number of uh, full-time politicians. Um, 
we have 911 elected full-time full -time parliamentarians in the UK. We've got 1,673 members of parliament in total. It's, it, it's a huge number. The complexity of it's the really complicated, and people okay. think, well, actually, maybe that's just too hard. Um, okay. Right, who's, let's open it up. Phil. You mentioned about um, AM should, you know, put, shut their laptops and, and listen to uh, debate. I mean, it would help if, you know, the, the first minister answered questions. And if he didn't answer questions, it would also help if the presiding officer made him answer those questions or advised him to answer. So there is a bit of a disconnect where people are not I taking interest because they know, you know, what sort of answer they're going to get from him, which is virtually nothing. Okay, that's a statement around the question, I think, but good. Yep. <laughs> On the front row. Bryn Roberts, uh, station manager made in Cardiff, which is going to be the local television station here. Do you believe, Peter, that um, having local television will and, and taking television nearer to the people will mean that it's going to be easier to inform them um, about uh, political issues? Uh, yes, it, it, it really should be. And one thing that I, uh, and, and, and my background is uh, b before worked in network news in, in, the, in the English region, so I, I have tremendous interest in and sympathy with the idea of local television. Um, but um, uh, yes, I mean, one of the uh, key things that's been missing from anything I said, I've, I think anything that's been said so far this morning, is about um, local authorities. I mean, where it's so much, you know, the hard work gets done, um, and um, where do they get a look in, in in all this? And you know, um, Cardiff City Council will, I'm sure, you know, be uh, enthusiastic partners to your work. That's a that's a clue for your first programming. Okay, uh, Justin. <coughs> Um, yes, just coming up to, to the point about democratic deficit. Um, I mean, in some ways, if you want to understand democratic deficit and the nature of it, watching the BBC uh, quiz show Pointless is uh, a good education because it shows that people can be fantastically well informed about a whole variety of different issues, but politics isn't one of them. Um, a slight clue to that might be, I mean, some research that I've been doing with a, a computer scientist at Bristol um, which, uh, where we've analysed uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, news articles and news reports across a whole range of, of media online using artificial intelligence techniques. What we've found is that when you look at the readability levels of different kinds of news item across a range of issues, politics comes right at the bottom. In other words, politics is the least readable, the least difficult to understand. And I wonder if what that actually tells us is something rather more symbolic that the way we cover politics is actually fairly impenetrable, often doesn't explain the bigger picture, why it's important, why it's meaningful. And that rather than try and jazz it up by making it around personalities, we need to think much more radically about the way in which we cover politics more fundamentally. Do, are there ways of doing it that can connect more profoundly with, as, as Peter said, people's deep interest in a whole variety of issues, a way of connecting with those and making the political scene more relevant to a wider variety of people. I think that's a very good point. Um, I mean, clearly, I'm in terms of the output that I'm directly responsible for, I'm at the most formal, most institutionalised end of the market. Um, and you're not likely to get a lot out of my output unless you've already got a willingness to engage with the institutions. So I don't think my output is the, the answer to the question that you pose, but I think that the question you pose is something that's very much in the minds of editors of programmes like Wales Today and Good Morning Wales in terms of how they go about uh, uh, covering things and that the language of politics is really difficult and it's about getting the language right um, and getting the examples right, the examples that really speak to the case and I you know, gave one very particular one on, on cancer treatment um, is, is how you get through to people, but it's it's always going to be um, an aspiration to to get there. Never never a done deal. It's never you know we never 
going to completely satisfy that because we are talking about doing something really difficult. And it is worth saying that, I mean, this worry about the democratic deficit is something that is, is not unique to this place. I, I, you know, it is um, a pretty much a commonplace amongst parliaments and institutions um, uh, uh, you know, across the democratic world. None of them think that they, uh, and, their, and their media, none of them think they've cracked it. Some worry about it. I mean, the, the example of the, the institution that worries about it the most is the European Parliament. But um, to some degree, they all worry about it. And if, if some people are uh, thinking I'm perhaps um, too outspoken about what I said about the Assembly, it is absolutely true that um, every chamber, uh, and I certainly include uh, Westminster in this, has significant flaws in the way it, it, it does its business in terms of uh, the way in which it can then interact with the audience. It is absolutely, none of this is unique to this place. Tim Huntley. Uh, yes, Tim Hartley. Just a quick anecdote. When they were establishing the National Assembly and I was working for the BBC, my suggestion to how we should actually cover this would be that all the assembly staff, and I think it was the six million pounds which came down the M4 from London to cover it, all those assembly reporters should be based in Wrexham for the very reason that it wasn't what was going on down here which was important, but what effect it would have on the people of Wrexham. Thankfully, that idea was ignored. However, the point I'm trying to make here is that isn't it true that audiences for uh, political programs on television will follow those programs wherever they are? You can jazz up the politics show as much as you like, it's the s same 3,000 sad sods like me who are watching it on a Sunday in Wales, whether it's at 11 o'clock at night or whether it's at lunchtime on Sunday. Um, I, I smile because um, I, I never ever uh, have a meeting, an encounter with a B one of my audience, BBC Pond, where they, that person doesn't use the word sad to describe themselves. It all, um, we, we do all of us have that kind of self-image. Um, <laughs> what I would say to you is this, that um, if we get it right, um, and the absolutely prime example of this is Question Time, it's a serious uh, political programme. It is possible, even though it's a late slot, to get massive audiences. Um, so, I, you know, I think that I, again, I think that we, it is very easy to be overly despondent on this that we just don't do politics, do we don't do it well enough, it doesn't reach anybody. Not at all. I mean, the, there there are mainstream ways still in which we're getting through to audiences. But I like, you know, I, I like what you say. And one of the interesting things about Question Time when I was at the BBC is it had the youngest audience of any news and current mm -hmm. affairs programme. Mm -hmm. you know, never mind all the experiments on BBC Three, actually in terms of getting to the you know, audience in their 20s at least and, and late teens, Question Time did the business. Okay, any final question for Peter before we move on? James. Yeah. Well, we'll jump in again, but um, the other Peter started off with a, you know, a pretty blunt confession that the, uh, the press made the decision while they've got their assembly and get on with it. Um, I think you know you've done a good job, and Betson's done a good job in getting uh, the BBC in London to understand the ins and outs. But here's a classic case on the Today programme this week, which is what four million audience or thereabouts. Mm. It's a big programme. Yes, they do the right thing in the link. They say this is England. We're talking about the health service in England, and then you have a huge item on you know the, the problems in community care and the health service in England, the impact on A&E and all the rest of it. It is actually a huge discussion about the health, the NHS. From then on, it's called the NHS. Yeah. But it's in England. It's just about England. Now, is the Today programme only for an audience in England? I mean, the Times can make that choice and say, OK, we don't care yeah. about whether we've got readers in Wales or not. But the BBC can't say that, can it? No, that's right. Um, and clearly, they, they, they need to also, uh, at times, uh, do Wales only stories and at times to make the comparison. I think what, what I would say is they can't be making that comparison in every single piece. The, the journalism just wouldn't, wouldn't happen if it was in every piece. But, but being reminded of the need to do that and the fact that you know, a great chunk of this doesn't apply in, in, parts of, uh, in parts of the UK, yeah, it's very important that people are reminded of that. So thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> now, Kevin Maguire has been straining to get into the discussion, so to uh, end this morning's uh, debate, we'll let him off the leash. Great to be back in Cardiff, where I was in the, uh, in the early 80s, in fact, at Richard's uh, journalism school. 
and he has a, a lecturer there called David English who's probably responsible for more journalists in the British media than anybody else and you may wonder how he can sleep at night without on his <laughs> conscience but uh, I, come to, I come to Wales pretty often normally South Wales it must be said I was in Swansea uh, last week where they said they now see Cardiff as equals because you've got a, a premiership football team uh, and I'll be, I'll be back uh, rather soon and there undoubtedly is uh, a democratic deficit. I think uh, we can see that in the turnout figures. And it, it's kind of ironic when you watch people in Pakistan queuing to vote recently, uh, despite the threats of uh, bombings, killings, and kidnappings. And maybe it's a, a good time to have it now here, this, this debate in Cardiff, because next week's the anniversary, the, the centenary of Emily Wilde and Davison, who died to get the vote on uh, the King's Horse and the Epsom Derby. Uh, so perhaps uh, you know, we, we should reflect, uh, reflect on that. And as a journalist, I don't see my role as getting people to the polls. Uh, but as a citizen, as somebody uh, you know, who, uh, who lives in this country, uh, I wish turnout was, uh, was higher. And I speak to you, yes, I'm associate editor on the Daily Mirror. I've worked in the past uh, on the Guardian, the Telegraph, the Press Association. Worked for a regional newspaper in the southwest and uh, for six months a magazine writing about uh, concrete. Uh, but I, I really speak to you as somebody with 30, nearly 30 years' experience, a member of the, uh, the NUJ, so I'm not just here given a, given a company line. But before you have your, uh, your council of despair, and there's been a lot of, uh, lot of despair, and I've looked at, the, at the, uh, the turnout on the Assembly, and it's quite right. It was 46.3% uh, in, uh, in 1999. Then uh, it, uh, it dipped alarmingly, 2003, just 38%, 2007, 43.4%. 2011, 41.4%. Uh, well down on what you get out of general election, which is 64.9% in Wales. Uh, way down, so fewer than half the people in Wales who could vote are bothering to vote. But if you think it's because there was a London-centric media, if you think it's because there are 10 London newspapers circulating nationally, which don't uh, cover Wales to your satisfaction, if you think it's because the main programmes coming out of the BBC, ITV, Channel 4 and so on in in London don't pay enough attention to Wales. I will just say that last year, the London mayoral election, Ken Livingstone, Boris Johnson, wall-to-wall -wall air coverage, wall-to-wall -wall newspaper coverage, the turnout was lower than in your Welsh Assembly elections. It was 38.1%. So I think, uh, by all means, shoot the messenger. I regard unpopularity as an occasional op occupational hazard. In fact, I quite like it and thrive on it sometimes. But be careful uh, how, you, uh, how you look at it. We might be part of the problem, but we're not the whole part of the problem. And I sometimes watch the assembly on TV. Yep, I've got an anorak as well as a remote control. I sit there on the sofa. It's as boring as hell. And I'm amazed anybody, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, watches it. And uh, you, may, you may want your Welsh opt-out on Newsnight so you can appear on it more often. Uh, but I tell you, in Scotland, most of the Scots I know wish they didn't have an opt-out on Newsnight because they feel they get enough uh, coverage elsewhere through their local media. And I personally think, and I travel around the UK, I watch a lot of uh, TV, I always buy the local papers, coming on to those in a moment, and I actually think BBC Wales Today and the ITV Wales Tonight isn't bad, actually, particularly when you see what else has, has got. I would like the regional news or the national news uh, opt-outs in sort of breakfast TV news to be longer. I think they're about three minutes now. I'd like those to be, uh, be longer. But you know, you, you've got pretty good media here. And I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't ignore that. And if I lived in Wales, I'd listen, listen to BBC Wales in the morning on the radio. I wouldn't listen to the Today programme. You've got pretty good output. Uh, just going on to uh, newspapers, and I might produce uh, a, a few facts uh, now. I was looking. It's very hard to get figures on national newspaper readership in, in Wales uh, because competing, uh, competing newspapers don't like to give them out. They also keep them uh, sort of pretty close to their own chest. And circulation areas, believe it or not, often include places like Gloucestershire and so on just because they're distribution uh, hubs. But I think, I think I've managed to get some. They're estimates, or you can call them guesstimates if you like. But according to my estimates, straw guesstimates, there's about 240,000 London-based national newspapers sold every day in, uh, in Wales. I reckon the readership is probably 600,000 or, or thereabout. The Mirror, 59,000 sold in Wales. I think the Mail, about 65,000. The Sun, 50,000. The Express, 20,000. The Star, 16,000. Telegraph, probably low tens. And I think the Guardian, Independent Times, Exit Peters, uh, uh, Patch and the FT, they're probably in thousands. But that's, uh, that's quite a big readership uh, figure, it must be said. And we won't cover 
Welsh politics to the satisfaction of most people in this room because we cover British politics. And yes, we could probably do more on Wales, and, and that includes me, although I think I probably do more than most, but it's because we cover, we cover, British, poli we cover British politics and you've got to fight your, your way in. Some things are interesting in Wales to the rest of the country, some are not. But that's, if you really want Welsh coverage, you buy a local paper. And you've got a pretty thriving newspaper uh, industry, yet you've still got six national newspapers. You've got the, the Mail, Echo, Post, Argus across the, uh, you know, the uh, Southern Belt. You've got the Daily Post and the, the Leader in Wrexham. And I reckon the combined circulations there are about 130,000. If you do readership and you kind of do roughly two and a half people read a newspaper, I think what they really mean is five in two, but nevertheless, uh, th th uh, there we are. It's about 375,000 people read your, your newspapers. And I, I would cherish them. I would cherish them because if they ever go... You'll miss them. And the answer to political engagement, really, or re-engagement in Wales, you'll find more in Wales than trying to look for it coming from London into Wales. So I would cherish those newspapers. And while their circulations have declined, for instance, the Western Mail is down 23,000, a lot less than when it was known as the, uh, the Coal Owners Gazette. Um, and I think, uh, I think it was 60,000 in, uh, in the early 80s when I, I was here. Uh, but while it's gone, the circulation paid for has gone down and there's fewer people actually buying it, it's now got a website that reaches 1.3 million unique viewers a month. There's 1.3 million different people look at that. Some of them will be in Wales, majority are probably in Wales, quite a few will be in England, and then there'll be the Welsh diaspora around the world who are coming, coming back. One time they'd have to wait for mum or dad to send them a, a copy of the paper in the post and get it a week late. Well, now you can watch it in real time. I do it. I surf all the, uh, the newspaper websites around the country for that. And I think the, the daily figure for the Western Mail is, is 66,000 people a day looking at that website. So these are sizable chunks of people who are engaging. And as I've been sitting there wanting to chomp up the bit, I think it is true that actually the London-based media can lead a debate. Whether it's Nick Robinson goes onto Twitter, people will follow that. I think you do need, in Wales, looking at it, you need basically authority figures, whoever they are, whether they're mainstream media, politicians, or people who rise up from communities who can take a lead in debates and get everybody else going on social media and Twitter, as well as in the mainstream media. But be careful, be careful what you wish for. If you just, if you just think you're, you know, there's a victim culture here, you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. It's quite thriving debate in Wales. The problem is it's not being translated into elections. And I think that is a, that's a big problem in society because people, in a way, you go down a pub and people will, say, will be talking about politics all the time. Then you say, do you vote? No, I don't vote. Why don't you vote? Well, they're all the same. Makes no, makes no difference. I always argue to them, well, you're taking yourself out of the debate. Partly because, yes, you can have a, an argument in a pub, but you go and vote for the party that's the best for you or the least worst, I often use that argument, which is fair enough, you will actually have a greater influence and politicians will have to pay more, at more attention to you. Often young people, and I was on the, uh, the radio this morning with a youth mayor of Bridge End, very bright, uh, bright young woman, uh, chatting to her beforehand. She said she wanted to be a social worker. And when I think, ooh, dear, <laughs> I hoped I didn't put her off, and then I tried to reassure her, because that's a tough, uh, a tough job. The reason, the reason politicians don't pay much attention to young people is they don't vote. While older people do, which is why, if you look at the, look what's happened in London, actually, older people have got, uh, they've still got their bus passes, they're still getting their winter uh, fuel allowances, they're still getting their free TV uh, licenses over 75. The reason they haven't uh, lost them, while people who are losing the bedroom tax, paying the bedroom tax, is those elderly people vote, while those people in, who are, by and large, getting the bedroom tax in C1, C2, DE, are less likely to vote. Uh, just one more set of stats. People who read newspapers are more likely to vote than those who don't. Uh, we may be accused of spreading cynicism. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But nevertheless, people who read newspapers are more likely to vote. The problem we have is getting people to buy newspapers who don't. The problems politicians have, I think, are getting to those who don't basically engage through the media, don't engage, engage directly. There was an Ipsos Mori aggregate survey after the 2010 general election, and I think the turnout in the general election, Peter will remember better, I think it was 65, 66%. The 10 national newspapers, and I'm afraid I can't Walesify these figures, but the 10 national newspapers, the turnout amongst readers of eight of them 
was higher than the national average, ranging from 81% at the Telegraph, 80% at the Times readers, 79 for the Independent, 78 for the Guardian, Mail 72, Mirror 68, Express 67. The two that weren't were the Sun 57 and the Star 43, where I suspect their readers didn't mind who got in the government, but just anyway, what her name was on page three. Uh, I, you know, I wonder why fewer people vote, and, uh, and it is something I'd, uh, I wish I knew the answer to, and I don't. I think it's partly the atomization of society, and people just go their own way now. They, they're just basically locally based. They feel governments have less power, and it's true. Politicians do have less power now than they, they used to. It's why they're all cower and uh, are frightened of, uh, of Googles and Starbucks and so on until, until very recently would, uh, would, would not want to criticize them. The Prime Minister had Eric Schmidt round on Monday at number 10. Wouldn't raise tax with him because he's just frightened of him. Uh, Ed Miliband did it. We'll see what Google do to uh, to him now. But people people have, have basically atomized. You know, old community solidarity isn't what it was. Yes, you can get great campaigns locally when something happens, and I'm going to watch with uh, great curiosity, interest, and perhaps even a bit of fun what's going to happen over the NHS reorganisation. Because you know those who are going to get a new hospital, well, they won't uh, thank you uh, until they've actually got it. While those who are going to lose something will fight tooth and nail. Uh, nailed to get it, but you know, people will vote an X factor in a way they won't in a general election. And yes, we can blame the media. Yes, to some extent, we can blame politicians. But I also, and I know politicians never like to do this, I sometimes vote electors too. And I say, why don't you do it? Why can't you be bothered once a year to go and put a, a, cr a cross on a, on a box? Uh, if you're really, really abstaining because you, you think they're all bad and it, it doesn't, it's not worthwhile, well, go and spoil your ballot paper. That shows you really care, not just staying at home and not bothering, uh, not bothering to do it. So, yep, in the newspapers, I'll take a little bit of the blame, quite happy to take a little bit of the blame. I'm not taking it at all. I'm not even taking much of it. I can write about the health service. You can change it. With Tony Blair, I could write about Iraq. Only he could invade it. And, yeah, I watch, uh, I watch politicians who won't give answers, not just to me, but they won't give them to other politicians. And I, I agree with your point about the, uh, the First Minister. The presiding officer, or deputy presiding officer, doesn't answer, should go back. Come on, let's have a yes or a no. You get, you get answers. People will have greater faith in, in politics and politicians, and perhaps engagement, if they get a straight answer to a straight question. So ch I cherish your local media. Have a pop at the London media if you like. But the problem is much broader than just the media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just um, push you? Do you think that London-based newspapers have any responsibility to explain the devolved <coughs> nation to all of their readers, wherever they live? Yes, I think we've got to, uh, we've got to be more accurate. Uh, for instance, writing about the NHS, you've got to write about it's the NHS in England, for instance. But I still pull my hair out. Like, often in a newspaper, you'll read that Dagenham is in Essex, when Dagenham has been a, a part of London for, mm -hmm. for 50 years. It's kind of these little inaccuracies um, do, do annoy. But if you're a national newspaper in an area of, you know, a Britain, what, 66, 67 million, something like that, the NHS that's affecting 55 million in e England will always be more interesting than the NHS that's happening in Wales with, what, three and a half, four million? Now, compare and contrast, yes, and we do that occasionally, but for instance, the reorganization, if they were reorganizing the NHS in the northwest of England, that's not of much interest, to be honest, to people who, who live in northeast England. And it's the same with the reorganization in Wales, it matters a lot in Wales, but it matters less around the country. Uh, and is there anything that people can do to try and improve accuracy? Acknowledging that that's a, you know, that's a base, should have your basic expectation, but we all know it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, well, it's, a, well, it's a problem. It's a problem you and I face. And every every time you spell somebody's name wrong or you get something a little detail wrong in a story, you just feel authority and is, is going a little bit more because if you can't get a name wrong, why are people going to believe you on a bigger issue? I think it's I think it's something. You know, we have to, we as journalists have to have to tackle. Of course, people's people's complaints are, are taken uh, are taken more seriously now than they ever were. Um, but it's something we accuracy is something we you know in the trade in the craft have to tackle. But it's important more journalists are trained in Cardiff and London. That's the one yeah, way. Of well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let me uh, let me uh, open it up to questions. Who'd like to kick off? I can't believe nobody wants to come back. Yeah, it's nearly lunchtime. <laughs>
Um, Ashok here. I'm, I'm a former BBC person, so apologies for that, but I'm not anymore. Um, in terms of the online development, certainly of the nationals, some of them have got two or three times now online readership as compared to sold in, in the paper shop readership. Is there scope there, or is there absolutely no interest there in developing political coverage from the nations and across England, for example, within those websites? I know the BBC actually do that, because I often uh, look at it myself for that, that reason. The, t the terrible truth is that, and I, s I say this as somebody who writes about politics and public policy issues, and it's try you know, how, you, how you explain what's, what's going on, on politically, that if you look at the Daily Mail website, which is now the second most read in the world after the New York Times, the Daily Mail website, what gets its traffic, what makes it the uh, second most read in the world, is its sidebar of shame. Which is which is really lots of lots of women in various states of undress, uh, occasionally with blokes, and they're they're actually normally people you would never have in the Daily Mail newspaper um, itself. So there is some scope for for politics, but up against entertainment and sport, they're the real big drivers of online traffic. I'm uh, I'm sad to say, and it's it's as true on say the Guardian website as it is on uh, the Daily Mail or the Daily Mirror or anywhere else you like. And I, often it, I don't know if the Guardians still do it, but they used to do the uh, best five read on, uh, you know, on, uh, on that website. And it would often be things like photos of the dog stuck up a tree and so on. It would be you know, real, real trivial stuff, which didn't reflect the paper itself, but that's where people were going for the traffic. And as, as, much, as, you know, as much as I want more politics in a, in a paper, however it's done, and I agree, I agree sometimes we, we concentrate too much on personalities, however much you want it, people don't buy it. You know, the, the great division in newspapers isn't between what we used to call the uh, tabloids and the broadsheets, it's between the popular and, un and the unpopular. And the unpopular, those with the lowest sales, whether it's the Independent, the Guardian, uh, or the Times, they're the ones that focus more on those public policy issues, and fewer people will buy them. And in the end, you know, you've, you've got to get you've got to get bought, you've got to get a bit to see, and you've got to get read. Okay, there was a question here. Thanks. Uh, my name's Ken Smith. I'm from the Port Talbot Magnet. I'm also chairman of the NUJ in Wales, as well. I think Kevin made a lot of very valid point, points, and it's good. And I think we should cherish the media in Wales and the job that it does. I think we have to be honest, though, as well, and say it does its, the job despite itself and despite decisions made elsewhere about the funding and resourcing of that media in Wales. And I think that's the particular frustration where you find local we weekly newspapers are closed at a week's notice. The resources that are there um, for the coverage of local events, which ultimately organizations like the BBC and national newspapers need and need to thrive um, for them to have the coverage of those issues at a local level that there's a big vacuum opening up there at this, at this moment in time there's a huge democratic deficit there as well despite the best efforts of people on the ground and I think particularly that's one of the big questions that we have to address here in Wales because that's part of the democratic deficit as well, that the decisions about funding and resources are made outside of Wales. And how do we address that issue, um, I think, is a key question as well. Uh, yeah, I think, I think in Wales, there are, you've got 40-plus weekly newspapers, uh, which is pretty high, high proportion. And I say let a 1,000 news, uh, news sources bloom, uh, you know, in, including you know, uh, new, uh, newcomers on the, uh, on the scene. But... There are huge commercial pressures. Whether you, whether you are running a website or whether you're running a daily, a daily paper, and I think the biggest selling local, you know, regional paper in Wales is the, I'm just looking at my figures, if they're right, is the Post in, uh, Post in Swansea. They're all under huge commercial pressures uh, because you sell, you sell fewer, so you get lower advertising rates, you've got lower income coming, uh, coming in. But I really, you know, welcome, welcome to everybody in the, uh, in the scene. How... Uh, how you deal with uh, with parent companies that are based in uh, in Britain or abroad in the states who are putting commercial pressures on editors? Uh, well, I don't know. Also, I'd probably get sacked if I did see it. What I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who else? Would, uh It, 
it, it depends what that project is, actually. Uh, some will have national significance, some will have regional, you know, national significance here in Wales, and some will just be very local in Wales, but it depends what the, it depends what the project is. You know. Nobody has a right to be heard. I think nobody should be ignored either. And it, depend, it depends what anything is. It's, got to have a, it's kind of got to have a significance. It's got, to, it's got to matter to people, or we think it matters to people, or people make it matter to us, and then we, then we give it to other people. But it depends, it depends, what, that, uh, depends what the project is. If, if you've got a particularly good story, have a quiet word with me afterwards. Don't share it now with anyone else who's a journalist. Right? <laughs> Tim. A significance to who should that story have? I fear that the significance is to you as political journalists. In a previous incarnation, the only time I got Rodri Morgan on the Today programme was because the policy that his party in Wales was taking was at odds with Tony Blair. The whole interview was not to do about public services in Wales and a new, fresh approach to it. But what does this mean about the disintegration of the British Labour Party and uh, some sort of anarchy within its ranks? So I'm going to throw it back to you and say, you're viewing this, you have framed these stories before you actually come to them in that boring political let's talk about personalities and splits uh, and the like, rather than look at, actually, is this a good idea? What does it mean in public policy terms? No, that's how you do it every time. You think, is this relevant to the readers, in my case, or if on radio or TV, the listeners or the viewers, and you frame it that way. That's what you do. It's not, uh, it's not a, it's, you're not sending a little note to yourself or just writing for politicians. I, mean, I always kind of joke with politicians, uh, for assembly members as well as MPs, that can make a choice whether they can be a victim or a source and give stories or be written about. But, the, uh, but you're, always write, you're always writing. You have in your mind's eye a reader, a viewer, a listener. That's what, that's what you're doing. If you, just, if you just wrote for other journalists, well, you know, get, a, get a job on the press gazette. But, but just to push back on that, I mean, it, it, as we talked about with, with Peter, so much of it is framed around political personalities and splits and the Westminster bubble, whereas actually there seems to be quite a lot of evidence that the public aren't interested in that framing of politics. They're much more interested in issues that affect their lives directly, yet politics doesn't get, doesn't get used that way, does it? Right. Two, th two things on this. One is personalities matter. You know, the parties have converged. Let's make no mistake about that. And the, inte the integrity and the personality of the, the politician does matter. Peter mentioned Nadine Dorries. Why was it a story when she was uh, taken back into, uh, into the Tory party? Two reasons uh, for that. One is uh, she's probably better known than most cabinet ministers because she was an I'm a celebrity. Now, I think I, so I'm a celebrity is a you know, pile of bush took her rubbish. But never, nevertheless, she was on it, she became known. Secondly, secondly, Peter, she probably made this one of the most devastating political attacks on the government last year when she de said David Cameron and George Osborne were a couple of arrogant posh boys who didn't know the price yeah. of milk, which rather, cap which rather captured them uh, politically. And personalities and background did matter then because it led through on the policies. Incidentally, the other most devastating uh, political uh, attack was probably by the 80,000 people in the Olympic Stadium who booed George Osborne, which led to the old joke, why did 80,000 people jo boo George Osborne? Well, that was the capacity of the stadium and they couldn't <laughs> get any more in. <laughs> but but, but, but personalities, personalities do matter, but we do, you'd be surprised. You, I mean, I'll take it you're a loyal mirror reader. You see how much we do do on policies and explaining them and campaigning on things like the bedroom tax and breaking it down and what it says, as well as doing housing benefit caps and you know, 250 quid your maximum for a one-bed flat and that. We do do policies, but you can't take them away from the personalities. You can't, you can't just separate the two. Yep, sometimes we'll, we'll get it wrong on the, on the personalities. Unquestionably, that's, uh, that, that's the case, but it matters. We've got time for a couple more questions for either for Gavin or more broadly to the rest of the panel. Would like to come in. Yep. Uh, Hal William for Kevin Bly. Just to just to ask them, what practical steps should say an institution like National Assembly be doing to maybe to to think about the relevance of the stories in the wider context you you set and maybe prioritise those stories that are particularly they feel may be relevant. And what would be the best way of then presenting them yep. to, your, to you and to the press? I think the, once you get out of Wales, the interest in Wales is the comparison with what's happening elsewhere. And in many, uh, I think devolution was a great thing in itself, and I actually think it's worked. Uh, it's worked, uh, worked for Wales. Uh, and we, t we take great interest on things like the smoking ban or abolishing car parking charges at hospitals. These are all, all initiatives that kind of, you lead away in Wales, is it a good way, is it a bad way? The big debate around the 
the health service? Should it be reformed? Should it not? How is it performing compared to the English health service? Because it's now Labour Wales, Red Wales. David Cameron always has a go now at Prime Minister's questions and quotes a load of, load of stats. I think if you've got, if the Assembly got raw, uh, raw figures to show the impact, and why, why does the health service perform the way it does in Wales and not in England? Now, there could be all sorts of legacy reasons with an industrial workforce, ageing, lots of health. It could be a problem with the health service itself, how it's run. But if you do those comparisons, if it can focus on those comparisons, that's where you'll get, I think, the wider, the wider interest. Yeah. You might win some, you might lose some, and of course it all comes down massively, of course, to politics, as, as parties will argue within, uh, you know, within, within Wales and within the Assembly, because they'll all come from a different political direction. So there's, there's probably no just single Welsh view, is there? The Welsh government has a view, but it's not universally uh, accepted. Okay, Justin News. Um, just a little corrective, I suppose. Both Peters made the point that the Welsh Assembly government uh, is incredibly boring to watch, and that you're absolutely right. It's really, really dull. What worries me, though, is that some of the things that I mean, you said, Peter, implied that we should make it more like Westminster. Um, and I'm not sure what people actually learn from watching Westminster in action. Yeah, it's better telly. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's actually much more informative telly. So, yes, it should be more interesting, but maybe the model there isn't Westminster. You know, there's a trap. There's a trap there. Why do they watch Prime Minister's questions in the, in the US? They watch it because it's Punch and Judy and it's something they haven't got, and they rather enjoy that. If it was a Socratic debate and everybody's sitting around and being reasonable, I suspect they wouldn't be watching it. But I must, I must admit, I, you know, I think it is boring when everyone's got their laptops in the Welsh Assembly, but I'm not sure it's any more interesting to see some fat bloke in Westminster sort of, you know, across a, across a green bench with an order paper. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, could I come back? Yeah. Um, I mean, just to be clear, I, I'm not saying that all debates in the Assembly are boring. I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> that's beginning to be what I'm hearing back. <laughs> <laughs> and while the deputy presiding officer was out, he'd be thinking, "What was going on while, while I was out?" out, while I was out we, the room. we have the tape speed; and we can see exactly what you said. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, what? And there. And um, I, I've talked about s certain flaws in the way in which um, uh, s uh, certain debates are conducted. But th there are ways of getting this right, um, and it's not just about doing punch and duty. So. I mean, if we just go back to the, the green energy debate um, uh, earlier this week, it's interesting as an example. The, pr the inherent problem with it was actually there didn't seem to be two distinct points of view. There was really a, 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 ju a consensus. So I'm not quite sure how it worked as a debate. For something to work as a debate, you really, really do need uh, two clear uh, points of view, two, two, di you know, two different places for people to come from. And, and so the problem in that particular instance is that's when, and that's what the one I had in mind when we had a simply a succession of scripts, of, of, of written speeches. Um, but the final speaker, um, before it went back to the minister, was the AM Antoinette, Antoinette Sunbach. Now, what she'd done is what all of you have been doing this morning, which is you've been uh, you know, doing this enormous courtesy, and I really do appreciate it, of actually listening to what we've been saying, and then coming back with, with, with effectively interventions, with, with points, and so and that's a debate. Yeah. And she got that, I mean, but she was the only one, I'm afraid, in that debate who did. Everybody else read out, and she'd listened, and she came back with a certain point. So it can be done, and it makes it more interesting, but there do have to be two points of view um, being, being, re re being represented. So it may be that the answer is actually more is taken into committee, and that, we d you, know, we d that you, you do less on the floor uh, in plenary. But... I mean, yeah, but you're right that in the end, there, there is, you know, are we making a choice here between, you know, that the, there's a, a common style of doing things, and we're, used to, we're very used to that thing, of there being a, a government and an opposition, and that binary division, and what the Assembly uh, works with is, is, is something that's actually um, a, a, a rather more complex and, and, and rather different. Okay, I'm, I'm Peter. Yeah, I just want to make a, 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 a couple of points. One thing... Um, and I, I endorse virtually everything that, that Kevin said. You know, we have very different backgrounds, but I very much agree with him. But I think it's two, what's emerged from this morning's discussions are kind of two different issues. One is what can happen in Wales to increase, going back to demographic deficit points. And, um, and I think there, I mean, th 
is a specifically Welsh issue, and there was the issue about how much you will get information from Welsh media as opposed to UK media, and there's a distinction there, and it, it's essentially it's developed the Welsh media. And the, so I think you used the word, uh, Richard, responsibility. Um, I'm always wary of responsibility in relation to journalism after, with Leveson. Um, one gets into some very, very difficult traps there, which I don't particularly want to get into. But I think the, what's the interesting thing is the comparative point is coming out. And I think what we are appreciating is it's done differently in different parts of the UK. Yeah. And I think the point Kevin made there are really good ones. And I, I think people are interested in that. Um, and, you know, why is one service done like this in Wales or in Scotland and England? And I think we'll get more of that as time goes on as devolution develops in, in, in the nations in that way. Can you just all come back to a slightly nerdy point? We focused on debates in chambers. And, you know, I agree, you know, private discussion is, is, is as it is, and it's livelier. And I, I funny enough, when, when it was first broadcast, the TV, I was in the States, um, I was the FT bureau chief there, and I was the commentator for C-SPAN, the first PM's question, because I was the only person around who knew all the people were. Um, <laughs> it was great fun doing it. It was just great um, doing it, for exactly the reason you say, Kevin. But one of the main things which affects people is the, the sausage machine legislation. I defy anyone to understand how legislation is done. Um, it is incomprehensible. Um, and there's a responsibility, actually, looking at the deputy presiding officer, on the parliamentary institutions and this is where the internet comes in, to explain it. Um, this isn't just to ordinary voters, but to interest groups of various kinds. Um, there's a guy called Richard Heaton, who's a parliamentary council in, in London, who is desperately trying to use online so that people understand what legislation is affecting. That's not to, do, not to disagree at all on the personality point and the dramas of politics and all that. Absolutely right. But there are some basic things um, where we've now got the ability so that people, if they want to understand what's happening or a policy going through, um, the institutions can do a much, much better job of explaining in non-technical language. You know, if I go onto a website, uh, you know, I, and heaven knows, I may not be a technological geek, but I'm a nerd on public administration. That's why I, I spend my money doing it, I get my own money from. But it, it's very difficult for people to understand the language used, particularly by civil servants and those specialists. And that you can do a hell of a lot to bridge the gap with readers by explaining things in easier language on really important changes that are going through. It's no good to say the public aren't interested. Well, the pub why should the public understand the technical language? Okay, final question here in the, uh, in the bench. Uh, Nick, oh, the Council of Wales. The uh, microphone's just there. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to go back briefly to Kevin's starting point. Uh, which was, uh, like Kevin, I, I was very struck by the media images of the uh, elections in Pakistan mm -hmm. and the fact that so many people were fighting mm -hmm. to exercise their democratic right in the face of mm -hmm. considerable um, kind of uh, safety uh, to the, their persons. Um, you didn't then go on to speculate as to why that might be, and I was wondering what you thought on that. I suspect it matters more mm -hmm. to them. It was the first time they were having a democratic change of of government, they see it. Government matters more to their lives than people do do in Britain. I think people are wrong in in Britain. Uh, and so I'll point the finger as well as I point the finger at myself and you know the political class, and I'll also point it at, at some voters. But they feel uh, maybe it's maybe it's contentment. Maybe they just don't feel driven enough but that their lives you know they're not too bad. You know, they'll carry on. They get a bit better. Get a bit worse. They just don't see it matters enough. I don't know what it is, but I just no. I I love political engagements. So there was no democratic uh, deficit. Everybody voted. I've even come around to the idea of, uh, of of compulsory voting in somewhere. Although I think if you fine them, it's probably not the wrong way. We can give everyone a ten pound voucher for Majestic or something. I don't know. There must be some <laughs> some type of way we can do it. The problem the problem is you can't really go to compulsory voting and say it's a civic duty until you're almost up at that hundred percent way now because. The biggest party at the uh, last election in, in, in Wales in the, uh, was, it was the abstentionist party or the people staying away. And in the assembly, well, they had a majority. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to round off with one question to each of our panellists. If you had to make one suggestion to the assembly for, for strengthening you know, political engagement in Wales and, and with the work of the assembly, what would it be? Oh, simplify the language you do. Don't believe that debates, and however admirable, um, and I, I, I watch on BBC Parliament, I'm very sad, I do, I do watch most of the questions, 
Um, I, I'm a weirdo. But the, <laughs> use, the, use the website to explain things more clearly to people in non-technical, accessible language of what's happening. Okay, explain on the website in simpler language, Kerry. Uh, by the Daily Mirror. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd, uh, no I'd, I'd say actually to, to, to every member, say what you think. Actually be honest and open and, and don't be afraid. And I know that's difficult in, you know, with party, uh, you know, party whips and so on. But I think that's what people want. They want, they want pol politicians who tell it straight and, and they answer it. I think, I think that is it. And I, know, I know, again, we in the media don't always make that easy because we shout split yeah. as well. And I think we've got we've to do that a bit less and have proper, more honest debate and, and okay. encourage it. Frank and open, Peter? I mean, the Assembly's got a, a huge a built-in advantage in the attention it gets to First Minister's questions. Um, and I think it's a question of the Assembly thinking in terms of how does it extend that to those areas of public policy in which um, the National Assembly of Wales has a decisive role. So education and health, transport are the most obvious ones that come to mind. But in those areas, how does it bring those issues to the fore how does it construct debates where the, the differences of opinion are clear, well articulated, and where it's clear that the Assembly members are listening to each other? Great. Okay, so thank you very much. We're going to break for lunch now, and we gather again in about 45 minutes, so it's not a long lunch break uh, for this afternoon's panel. But please join me in thanking Peter, Kevin, and Peter.